Hello. Welcome to Books and Brews. The place where beer and literature meet. With your host, certified Cicerone, Michael Agnew. And Laura Mosica, author of The Blue Bells Chronicles. Each month we invite a guest author to read their words and talk about writing while sipping beers specially paired with their work. Today's guest is Teresa Halverson. So sit back, pop a cold one, and dive into some books and brews. Welcome to Books and Brews, episode number 59. Laura, what have you been up to this month? <laughs> Um, well, you know, it's been an interesting month between your foot surgery and your birthday and Valentine's Day. Um, I did some more knitting, if I can pull this up without having it fall all over the place. Um, my friend taught me to knit with a loom in November, and so I have this beautiful scarf. Oh, that that's awesome. Really yeah, and this one's taking a long time because I made it quite a bit wider. It's a much thicker yarn, and it is going to go absolutely beautifully with a vintage cloak that I have. So, Teresa, I think you can appreciate this as an author. One day I was reading through my draft, and I realized uh, my characters don't seem to actually have any clothes on. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so I started researching and, you know, what would Amy wear? And as I was researching, I came across this beautiful, they call the vintage, like from the 60s. To me, it doesn't look like 60s at all. But this absolutely beautiful woolen cloak in kind of those colors. So I bought it. But other than that, uh, I think lambs are kind of a highlight. Yes, of our new lambs. Yeah. Oh. Oh, how fun. Yeah. So um, a couple years ago, we started with, can I even keep a head of lettuce alive? Because I- In the fridge. <laughs> on that, I planted You're a seed right. in the ground. And once we could keep, once I could keep a head of lettuce alive, we moved on up to chickens. And I read so much on the internet that I was like, oh my gosh, this is rocket surgery trying to keep chickens alive. How does anyone do this? I mean, if you start reading forums, it sounds really complex. And I found out it's not. You toss them feed. And if you don't mind them pecking your butt when you're down on your knees getting their eggs, you know, you're, you're okay. Um, although I do discuss that with them every single day. I don't peck your butt and you don't peck mine. <laughs> they tend not to listen. They, they I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> well, aside from teaching mm -hmm. rapid surgery to chickens, uh, have you been reading anything else? Yeah, I have. I finally finished Ill-Gotten Gains, and it is not a reflection on the author. It's a reflection on how busy our lives are. <laughs> so it took me forever to finish the book, but it was a really good book. And thank goodness, I finally got so sick that I couldn't go take care of the animals. So I finally had time to read. So I finished that, and I really enjoyed it. That's actually by a, one of our previous guests, Ralph Geralds. And oh. so I enjoyed that. And I still need to finish his other book, Jesus and Judas, which oh. is a fascinating historical account. Well, you know, based on his historical research. Yeah. In which he theorizes that Jesus and Judas probably knew each other in Egypt from the time they were very young. So um, it's very interesting. And then I got time to get back to Destination Harmony, a novel of the Owenite Experiment hmm. by Re Rebecca May Hope. And it's a fascinating story of uh, historical account, although the main character is fictional, of the brightest minds in the country deciding they were going to set up a utopia in Ohio and show the world how to live. So the brightest minds in the country all got in a boat, I, I think in Philadelphia, in January. It did not occur to a single one of them that January is the time when rivers ice up. And, oh. <laughs> and so they got jammed in the river for, I think, a month. They were sitting there iced in because the brightest minds in the country didn't think of that. And then, of course, I read River City Widows by <laughs> our guest. But do you want to talk about what you've been reading? Well, I've been reading this, which is a book we wrote together, but I've been reading it uh, using audio to record an audio book. 
So I'm uh, up about in about the middle of the book right at the moment, and uh, hopefully I'll be done and we'll be able to have audiobooks soon of a number of the things that both we've been working on together and Laura has had for years. So other than that, the only thing I've been reading is the newspaper and a book on how to do computational chemistry with quantum computing, which nobody's going to want to know about. So <laughs> perhaps you could introduce our guest this month. Sure. <laughs> so as I said, I'm getting over an illness, so hopefully I'll edit out 90% of the coughing. <laughs> but we have worked way too hard to set up this day because mm -hmm. we're both very busy. Teresa Halverson has a don't tell me I can't do that attitude about life and is an author, publisher, editor, and YouTuber. She's overly caffeinated, which I should be at this moment, and at times wine soaked, which perhaps I should be at this moment. <laughs> and perhaps I was not too long ago when I stayed up too late writing. The author of multiple cross genre works, including Warehouse Dreams, Lost Aboard, and River City Widows. Teresa wonders what sleep is. Did I mention I was up till three writing? <laughs> yes, and then up uh, right and early this morning too. Yeah, which is probably why the cough has come back. But back to Teresa, she's the owner of No Bad Books Press and one of the hosts of the popul popular YouTube channel, The Semi-Sages of the Pages. In whatever free time is left, ha, huh, Teresa enjoys board games, concerts, geeky conventions, and reading. Her life goal is to give, oh my gosh, this book is so good, happiness to her readers. She lives in Temecula with her husband, her adult children, their partners. She has no idea who actually lives in her house and who's just visiting, and many pets. Uh, find her at TeresaHAuthor.com. Did I get that correct? You got it right. Uh, that came up in very small print when I pasted and copied for some reason. You can also find her on TikTok and Facebook and we will ask you at the end where to find that so that said we are ready for cocktail number one and this one i was inspired by the queen of hearts and found a cocktail that actually is uh called the queen of hearts and so what we have is uh we first start out with a glass where we have some simple uh syrup and black sanding sugar for the rim in order to uh start to get into the theme of the uh, queen of hearts then we mix some uh, rum, some raspberry vodka, and some grenadine, which I have in here with some ice. We'll take that up, and then I pour some ginger ale into the glass, and we will finish off with the mixed part of the drink. And so you end up with a kind of neat color with the uh, black sugar, and it should be an interesting mix of uh, kind of sweet and good flavors. So this is called the Queen of Hearts. You can see it has a kind of nice reddish color here. Yes. I Cheers. like the black rim. That's awesome. I love that. Isn't that the neatest thing? I did not know until last night there was such a thing as black sugar. What do you think? Mm, that's very good on a sore throat. <laughs> it just oh. not know what the bartender was intending. I do like that, though. Didn't you remind me we had, like, purple sugar? We did uh, in... Uh, one of the readings in one of our previous authors uh, it was set during the halloween time so i made kind of a witch's brew of a purple cocktail with purple sanding sugar oh. uh, it's a very nice uh, cocktail as well yeah. so go ahead with reading number one all right okay so this is from wonderland's mad queen and it's in the anthology queens in wonderland i was so disappointed in the mad hatter i'd expected him to sing us a song and be more Silly insane, not just weird. Cheshire's grin wasn't white enough. He wasn't purple stripes like in the latest movie. He was gray and I could totally see him sitting in the tree. Cheshire's my favorite character and I was super disappointed. I requested a refund. The chessboard makes no sense and where is that in the movies? Why would you add a station that wasn't in the movies? I'm not sure Caterpillar should smoke at all what kind of message are you sending to the children and a hookah of all things is that even legal we must adapt to modern times and smoking is disgusting and sets a poor example bailey or alice as she insisted on being called turned over the page and folded her hands in front of herself looking at each of the station leads no one said anything even the mad hatter who always had a quip for any situation 
What do you have to say for yourselves? Bailey asked. Cheshire stripes slowly began to fade into the beigeness of the conference room. Do not, Bailey or Alice snapped, pointing her finger at Cheshire. Cheshire stopped fading, their green eyes locked on the conference room table. Nothing to say, Bailey asked. Well, I have lots to say. I am deeply disappointed in each of you. You are personally responsible for the performance of Wonderland and meeting our guests' expectations is paramount. She reached for a glass of water, took a small sip, and refolded her hands. I know you can all do better. Hard work is ahead, but if we make some tweaks, I know we'll meet the metrics expected from you. The white rabbit cleared his throat, but Caterpillar shook her head. If you all have nothing to say, then you may leave. Except for the Queen of Hearts, I need to speak to her further. Bailey or Alice dropped her head into her hands, her blonde hair, blonde hair flopping forward to cover her face. The station leads, the Mad Hatter, White Rabbit, Caterpillar, and the White Queen trudge from the conference room, the White Queen meeting and holding my eyes for a single electrifying second. Then the door slid shut behind him, anger churned in my chest, and I kept having to swallow the words that wanted to bubble forth. How dare those guests insult Wonderland? It was true, the station leads were all mad idiots, but how dare the guests talk to us like that? What had we done to deserve such ire? It was going to take removing a few guest heads to fix this problem. The next time one of those carriages rode through my croquet garden, I'd shout the magic words, off with their heads. And Ace, my executioner, would obey me or lose his own head. Are they gone? Bailey asked. I pushed down my anger and straightened my crown. Yes, I stated. Bailey raised her head and sighed dramatically, pushing her hair out of her face and smoothing it under the giant blue bow she wore. I wasn't sure why Bailey had been put in charge of Wonderland, but she looked a bit like Alice had. Smooth blonde hair, pale skin, and flushed cheeks. Though she was very grown, with lines around her eyes and bracketing her mouth, she wore short blue dresses with white tights and black patent leather, leather shoes. Thank you for staying behind, Bailey said. She smiled, a toothy pretend grin that didn't reach her eyes. I wanted to let you know, while Super Mega Fun World, LLC, is unhappy with the Wonderland theme park and the way the current cast members lack the drive to make this park as extraordinary as I know it can be, you are the exception. I was. How curious. Let me read some of the comments about you. The Queen of Hearts is the best part of this trip. I got an amazing video of her shaking her flamingo and screaming off with their heads. I couldn't believe how iconic the Queen of Hearts was, especially with how disappointed I was with the rest of Wonderland. She made the experience for me. I'll be back just to watch her play croquet and yell at the playing cards. I know it wasn't real, but the Queen of Hearts was so mad. She made my heart beat faster and my hands shake. Great job, and she totally made the cost worth it. Perhaps Bailey wasn't so bad after all. The guests adored me over the Mad Hatter in Cheshire. Thank you, I said, and meant it. Super Mega Fun World LLC is pleased with all your hard work this last year, Bailey continued. Your lovely croquet garden, how you make the hedgehogs run on the grass, order the guests to die, and pretend to drag them off for beheadings. Pretend? I'd actually ordered that woman beheaded, I corrected. Wonderful. Very nice. So what, what was the premise of this anthology that this was in? So this is um, a Wonderland themed anthology. It's actually due out February 28th. Um, so it'll be out when this airs. Um, and it's uh, an LGBTQIA anthology. But it's all based on Wonderland as an Alice in Wonderland. Wonderland's characters, yeah. Okay. So does uh, Bailey know that this is the actual Queen of Hearts? Yeah, she does. So as the story continues, you'll find out that basically executives came down, found Wonderland and said, we're going to turn this into an amusement park. Oh, interesting. So it's based on that premise that it's real. So yeah. why didn't they bring the rest of the characters in? Why did they bring actors in instead? They're not actors. They're the actual... Oh, I mean, so the Cheshire Cat is not an actor? No. Nope. Oh, funny, but people think that he is. That he is. So they're That's paying money to tour Wonderland, and the executives actually found Wonderland. 
Oh, that's amazing. That's a really neat concept. I'll, I'll send you the, yeah. um, the full story. You can, you can see how oh, it evolved. That. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So, you know, it's really hard. I think you're an independent author and you do a lot of freelance writing. It's hard building a career as that. And I think you've done a lot of it by networking with other authors, by getting your name out there and things like the anthologies. Do you look for calls for submissions or how do you find these anthologies? I do. Um, this anthology is actually put out by No Bad Books Press. So I was actually one of the editors oh, okay. too. But yes, I look for calls. I'm actually going to be in uh, in Temecula. We have a Temecula writers group um, and uh, they just did an anthology call for stories based around Temecula. Um, and Temecula is actually very haunted. It actually has a pretty fascinating history. I'm doing a, a spooky ghostly story uh, for Fun. that one. Yeah. Our author last month was, um, he wrote Niagara's Most Haunted, mm -hmm. I believe is the correct title, among other things. So we've had a few authors talking about hauntings lately. Tell us a little bit about your nonfiction. Uh, so for my nonfiction, are you referring to the dad's playbook? So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the dad's playbook to labor and birth, I wrote that one. 14 years ago now. Um, and that was when I was in kind of the childbirth and the doula land. Um, so I used to be a childbirth educator um, and a doula. So a doula is like a birthing coach. Mm -hmm. And as I was doing that, and as I was working with couples, I realized there weren't very many books for men about how to support their partners through labor and birth. So I put together a book proposal. Um, it's uh, a trad published book. And then my husband, of course, uh, helped co-write that with me. And that was the first book I ever got published. Isn't, isn't it supposed to be just one page? Don't faint in the delivery room. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, no. From my personal experience, I have nine children. Um, I'm sorry, I have given birth eight times. Yes, it's too early in the morning for this. <laughs> and I'm three hours behind you. You're, you're at six in the morning. I I admire you getting up that early. For me, it would have been more like I stayed up that late. <laughs> so from my personal experience, the best advice to husbands is do not turn on the commitments while your life, your wife is in labor and your life is in the balance. <laughs> yeah, that's good advice. Um, yeah. So I was curious that you mentioned this book is specifically for fathers of women, what did you say, who are going to have more of a, you know, in hospital delivery with an epidural? Mm -hmm. Why an epidural in particular? So um, as I was kind of going through that world and everything else, there was a lot of um, books out there about how to have a natural birth. Okay. And as I was working with um, women in my doula days, there were a lot of women who were like, I kind of want an epidural. Is that okay? And they felt very judged. There's a lot of judgment uh, for yes. a lot of judgment for women about how they, you know, their pregnancies, their birth, their babies, how they raise them and everything else. And I really just wanted a book that was about like, it's your choice. Right. Um, you know, the, the mom. reason that really stuck out to me was because my oldest son is uh, 34. My youngest is 18. And during most of those years, I was having babies. Natural childbirth was a big thing. And I was kind of like, are you crazy? If you don't want your drugs, I'll take mine and yours too. <laughs> Why Why do you want to be in vain? And by the ninth one, man, epidurals scare me, you know? Mm. They go, okay, hold really still, and we're just going to stick this in. And if you move at all, you might be paralyzed for life. I'm like, oh, way to help me relax. Thank you. <laughs> um, by the, the ninth child, first time I went to the doctor, I was like, can you please just knock me out the old fashioned way? Can we go all the way back to the 50s? And the anesthesiologist said, when I was a younger anesthesiologist, I would have argued with you about what's safer, blah, blah, blah. And now it's like, you know, almost nobody dies from anesthesia if it makes you happy. And oh my gosh, that was such a load off my mind for the entire nine months. Went to sleep, woke up with a baby. I'm like, why did we ever leave the 50s? I like this. <laughs> exactly. And again, for the advice for dads, the idea of an epidural is to make sure you don't forget to carry your wife home because she can't walk. 
<laughs> there you go. <laughs> so uh, what is your best advice to dads? Oh, best advice to dads. I would say um, it's A, listen to her and prepare in advance to um, labor goes on for a long time, especially if it's your first baby. It goes on for a long time before you get to the hospital and it can be pretty uncomfortable. So just be prepared with um, water and washcloths and help her move around the room and don't panic. I think that's probably the biggest thing. Don't like stare at her and be like, do you need anything, honey, or anything else? Just let her do her thing. And then the other thing I would have to say is one minute, she might be totally fine and be like, leave me alone. And then five minutes later, she might be like, where'd you go? I need you. That's also normal. So just, just roll with it. I, I have other advice. Come to the hospital and pick your wife up the next day. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> uh, there's there's a little story behind that. When my fifth child was born, he was actually born on Christmas Day in Bremerton, Washington. And we had a freak snowstorm the next day. And so there was a little bit of an excuse for my then husband being very delayed in picking me up. But at a certain point, the nurses were like, well, your 24 hours is up. We can feed you, but we can't give you any medical care. And I'm like, are you kidding me? If I start bleeding out, you're going to bring me a hamburger? I don't believe oh you. <laughs> yeah. No. I think you're going to give me some medical care. And a hamburger. And a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll try and edit out all that hacking and coughing, and we're ready for cocktail well, number two. Or you had a question? Well, all I was going to say is if we're going back to the 1950s, you were mentioning things that the wife needs. I would have to think it would include a shot of whiskey, too. Oh, <laughs> 1950s, yeah. Good idea. <laughs> cocktail number two. All righty. The next cocktail I have, the River City. So I thought in relation to that reading, you know, that's got a whole kind of cultural aspect to it. The idea of being on like the Mississippi River in a river city with the paddle wheelers and all that kind of a thing. So I found a really neat cocktail, which uh, especially for a Saturday morning uh, is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, this is basically like a, a creamsicle in a in a glass. So we first start out with some sun-kissed orange soda, which is made, of course, with real sugar. We don't do high fructose corn syrup. We're back in the, uh, you know, the era of, um, of real sugar. Then we put a scoop or two of vanilla ice cream in. Of course, the ice cream is trying to stick to the scoop, but we'll take care of that. That ice cream is kind of softened, which probably makes it a whole lot easier to work with. And yes. that is looking really good. And then the piece de resistance, which is two ounces of whipped cream vodka. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Yes. So, you know, it's a creamsicle, but one with a uh, serious kick. And then, of course, because we have to kind of keep the creamsicle shtick going. We're going to put a little bit of whipped cream on top of this. And now we have the River City. Oh, fun. Oh, that's beautiful. Some just orange soda, the vanilla ice cream, some nice whipped cream vodka, and a little bit of whipped cream. Cheers. And I'm going to end up with whipped cream mustache. <laughs> I almost, oh, wow, that is so good. Um, kids, Happy Saturday morning. <laughs> kids, you should not be drinking alcohol at nine in the morning. Kids, you shouldn't be drinking alcohol at all. But for the adults who also shouldn't be drinking at nine in the morning. We'll drink to them. <laughs> Teresa, I think that... Um, We've mixed up the order of drinks, so we should probably go to the River City Reading. You got it. You got it. All right. Here we go. Okay. Leave the bartender to mess things up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is from River City Widows, Chapter 1, Sunday. Gabe, come on. We're going to be late. Get your jacket. Nothing. Gabe. I barked up the stairs, adding that sharp mom tone, the tone that says, don't you make me come get you. Nothing. Seriously. I'd given him 30-minute, 15-minute, and 5-minute countdowns. He'd responded to each one. Now, when we had to leave, he wasn't answering. Polly, I called for my spot at the bottom of the stairs. I'd almost forgotten about my stepdaughter. She'd gone away to college in Arizona three years ago and would graduate with a history degree in a year. 
She'd woken me with a knock on the front door at 5 a.m. today, asking to crash in the guest room. I'd barely heard from her in the last three years. Just a place to stay over spring break, she'd said. Then Polly had wheeled her suitcase into the guest room, unpacked, showers, and made herself breakfast. When I'd asked her why she was here, she said she wanted to surprise us and reassured me all was fine. It was just a spur of the moment road trip, she'd said, and had loved the adventure of driving all night. She was a terrible liar. Polly, I called again. Did you want to come with us to dinner? If so, we have to leave or we won't make our reservation. No response. No whispers of movement over my head. No footsteps on the stairs. No flush of a toilet. Just silence. Had she and Gabe gone out and not told me? I shivered, a cold puff of air flowing around family room and kitchen. Someone must have opened a window. Guys, I called again, starting up the stairs. My foot hit the squeaky step I usually avoided, and the board wailed. I cringed, hating the sound. I pulled my to-do list, a tiny spiral notebook with a blue cover, out of my pocket and added a note to get the step fixed. We're going to be late for pizza, I called. It's your favorite, Gabe. Goosebumps popped out on my arms as I reached the upstairs landing. It felt so much colder up here. I'd have to remind Polly of the rules. No opening windows, even during the summer. It wore down the sashes and windows were expensive to fix in my 1940s home. I knocked on the closed door to Gabe's bedroom. No answer. Gabe? I cracked open the door. It was dark except for his Hulk nightlight casting green tinged shadows. There were lumps in his bed. Gabe? I said again. Was he asleep? Maybe he was getting sick. God, I hope not. That would destroy all my plans for this week. The lumps in his bed didn't move when I flicked on the light. Gabe? Stepping into the room, my foot landed on a metal car. I winced and bent, bent over to put it into its container with the other toys. Gabe! The lumps didn't move. I pulled back the blanket and spreadsheets, bed sheets, expecting to find my son curled into a giggling lump, playing some sort of one-sided hide-and-seek. But there was only the laundry I'd folded two days before. The laundry I'd placed on his bed for him to put away. He'd created a nest of clean laundry and then slept on it. He'd been sleeping on the clean laundry. I puffed out a sigh. What the heck was wrong with him? Why on earth would he look at a pile of laundry and think, that's a good place for a nap? I gathered up the clothes and tossed them into the basket. I'd deal with it later. Later is always better. I stuck my head into the bathroom. No Gabe. He wouldn't have left, right? A dim light shone from the crack beneath Polly's door. I wondered if she'd thrown a scarf over the lamp. I hope not. The last thing we needed was a fire. I knocked. Polly, is Gabe in there? We need to leave for pizza. No answer. I didn't want to just walk into her room. She was 21 and I learned when she was 15 not to do the quick knock and open the door parent thing. She'd been so upset. Rightfully so, I now acknowledged. I pressed my ear against the door and recoiled. It felt like a window when snow was falling outside. She absolutely had her window open. Polly? I cracked open the door. I'm so sorry to barge in, but do you know? She and Gabe sat in the middle of the floor surrounded by lit candles, the light flickering across the walls. A game sat in front of them, and a white thing spun on the board like a top. They let out a screech, and I echoed it. The white piece left off the board and shot toward me. I jumped, and it zoomed under my feet, hitting and gouging the wall. Is that a Ouija board? I flicked on the light. Gabe leapt to his feet and kicked a candle onto the floor. Fire! With a screech of fear, I stomped out the flame, pressing candle wax into the original hardwood floor. Who? What? Floor? Why? My brain stuttered, words stuck in my throat. Don't pick up that candle, I yelled as Gabe bent over. He straightened, tears in his eyes. I never yelled at him. Candles? On the floor? What were you thinking? I screamed. Sorry, Mom, Gabe whispered. Right then, he looked so much like his father, my breath caught. Even though Gabe had my blonde hair and hazel eyes, I saw Miguel in Gabe's face more and more as time passed. They had the same frown, the same smile, the same snarky quirk of his eyebrows. I took a deep breath and then another, controlling my temper so I could speak. What were you guys doing? Polly hadn't moved from her spot on the floor, hadn't even looked up. She just stared down at the board with its white rows of lettos arcing across the top. Gabe answered, his shoulders hunched, his hands stuffed in his pockets. Nothing. Polly just brought this game and I'd seen it in a movie. Wanted to try it. What movie? He shrugged again. Go get your jacket. We're going to be late.
Gabe slunk from the room. And Very nice. It. Thank um, you. I love that opening. And I just, I, I think, is there a cat moving around behind you? There is, yeah. <laughs> this is Winchester. He's been hanging out the entire time. I, I was I've, part of Temecula's haunting. <laughs> yes. I've I've noticed him, and as you were reading, I just thought, you know, the cat features prominently in the book. So obviously you like cats. Yes. Yeah, I do. I do. I absolutely loved cats the whole time I was growing up. And um, we had them most of the time my kids were at home from the time my daughter was five until uh, that cat lived to be 20 years old or 19, close to 20. Um, so we had cats for 20 years and I still love cats, but I'm not missing the litter box. And um, if Michael were here, he might show his cat, Bailey. Uh, we, we have a really neat picture of him holding up his big cat, Bailey, in one of our programs. So what got you interested in the field of parapsychology that features prominently in this book? Um, I think I always have been. I mean, I remember going to the library and like grabbing all of the books that I could get my hands on, both fiction and nonfiction, um, just about ghosts. Um, it's always kind of fascinated me this idea of history and whether or not ghosts are real, whether or not they're intelligent, whether or not uh, they're just echoes of the past time, whether or not they're overlaying our present reality or not. I mean, there's so many fascinating theories about it. You know, I have an interesting ghost story. And for anyone who's interested in this, also check out our previous video with uh, Peter Andrew Sacco. And I think the book is called Hauntings of Niagara. Oh. And he actually had a program, a, I believe a TV series about hauntings. But quite a few years ago, in fact, 2014, so almost 10 years ago now, I went to Scotland and I went to a Lacranza Castle, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, and the stairway is barred. It's more of a ruin, really, and it's on the Isle of Erin where Robert the Bruce is said to have spent that uh, lost winter of 1306 to 1307. So I took a picture looking up this stairway and you know, I took the picture, I was looking up an empty stairway. When it came out on my camera, there was a very clear human form, uh, kind of grayish, you know, typical ghostly, but it was very clearly human form. So that was fascinating to me. Um, I've had some houses where I'm like, yeah, something's off here. And I never know, is it because I have a big imagination or is am I really feeling something? But that obviously brings up the question, do you believe in ghosts and have you had any experiences? Yes, absolutely. Or <clears throat> believe, <clears throat> excuse me, believe in some sort of energy sharing, reality sharing or something like that. I don't believe we lived in a true haunted house. I actually think the energy of the people who lived behind us, before us, left something there because that mm -hmm. house was weird um we first of all when we moved in it um we had to have the cleaners come back out again it was disgusting and the cleaners said that when they came out they were like we spent like two days cleaning this already the people before had trashed the house um we found weird things one of the bedrooms um had a, a padlock on the inside room of oh, wow. so they probably rented it out Mm -hmm. Um, one of the cabinets smelled so much of pot, like they'd obviously been keeping their stash in there, but the weirdness of the house was that in the hallway, the boards creaked and at night we really could hear footsteps or movement or something at night on that hallway. We had lights off and on all the time. The boys were much younger. So I was like, turn off the lights. And they're like, I swear, mom, I did faucets were left on all the time and the house just felt horrible. It was just horrible. Um, we managed to get out of that house in about three months, but I was so happy to leave it. Um, it just was not a fun place to live. We had a benevolent ghost in Yeah, Minnesota. Yeah. And we talked about that with Peter. Mm -hmm. um, we swear we had a ghost. Things disappeared. The first being our wine and our Irish cream. 
but very things, serious. <laughs> right. We were very upset by that. <laughs> but things appeared too. And anyone who's interested can watch the outtakes from the last video where I show the the candle that appeared on our mantelpiece that was completely bare. And yeah, That's it was a good the, one. Was, we had been in the house for eight months. There is no way I didn't notice that for eight months. And this was a candle neither of us recognized, had ever seen. It was a little votive candle in brown glass. And then a pair of readers appeared on the counter. Which that, were neither of our prescription. Well, no. I don't know. Yeah. But they fit me perfectly. They they worked perfectly for me. And then the the little tiny tile to our shower appeared. There was a little tile, like what, missing. an inch square, yeah. missing from the mosaic. And we'd been in the house a year and a half. And one day I was just sitting there on top of my dresser. Oh. And the top of my dresser was always very neat and clean because I had a great closet that could be neat and clean. And all of a sudden, just there it was. So, yeah, we had a benevolent ghost. And I don't know. It, it was interesting. What was the other? Oh, I know the other question I wanted to ask you. One of the things that really comes out in this book, you're talking about the ghost of Ruth, and I believe her husband's name was Jack. Mm -hmm. And, um, right. excuse me, and as they read through Ruth's diaries that they eventually find, they discover that when Jack comes back from the war, he's very changed, and this is World War II, and he's become kind of verbally, at least verbally and emotionally abusive. And you talk about he probably had PTSD, which wasn't recognized right. in the 40s and 50s. And you sort of explore, without stating it directly, you explore this question of how much are we a little bit victims of the things that happen to us versus you know, you don't have to be abusive. Where do you fall on that question? You know, how much do you think most people can control or do you think it differs from person to person? Oh, I think it differs from person to person. Um, I think, so I have a degree in psychology um, and we, we really don't understand the mind very well at all. Um, we don't understand why some people can go through an experience and come out fine, unchanged. And someone else can go through the exact same experience and have a significant personality change. We don't understand severe mental health issues like schizophrenia and bipolar. We medicate for it. We try to help people with it, but we don't understand it whatsoever. And I think, I mean, abuse is never, ever, ever okay. But I think there does at times need to be the grace um, for understanding people are ill, especially if they've gone through something, something horrific, which Jack presumably did in World War II, you know, need to protect the people around, but also need to understand he's sick mm -hmm. and need, needs help for that. Yeah, I like that answer. And um, have they isolated, you know, any reasons why some people are better able to overcome these things and maybe go on to be nice people and not you know? that I know of, not that I know of. I know there's probably counselors that work with people with PTSD that can try to figure things out. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we are such a multitude of, of our past and what we experience. And that's probably why everyone reacts to things so differently is that everyone's reactions from the moment they're born, everyone's experiences from the moment they're born are also different. It's a yeah. fascinating question, and it's actually something he and I talk about because we both have people in our lives where we look at the family and go, um, and this is multiple families, where they grew up with the same parents, but one kid is just, you know, a hot mess, if they're lucky enough to be a hot mess, <laughs> and uh, the other kids are handling it and, like, come out rising above it and and not flashing and flaring out at other people. So it's it's a very fascinating question to me. It is. And, and, and I really like that you addressed that. Thank you. Well, and you can look at, you mentioned you have twins. My boys mm -hmm. are twins as well. And I mean, my boys are identical twins. Mine and too. They're, I mean, they're, I wouldn't say they're very different. They're interested in the same things and everything else, but they are two 
different people with different experiences and different attitudes and different opinions and everything else. So yeah. yeah I used to laugh on the twins forum when some of the mothers, the very young twins were very, um, I'm going to make sure that my children are individuals. I'm like, you do not need to worry about that. They will, you know, to be fair, some of them were first time mothers, whereas for me, my twins were number seven and eight. And um, I have the experience to know they're going to be their own person, mm -hmm. no matter what you do. You don't need to worry about that. But yeah. We are ready for cocktail number three. Number three. three. And I was inspired by the, uh, in the reading uh, by Chicago. And so, you know, I was very interested and found this cocktail that's kind of a very old school kind of a cocktail. Um, we start off with uh, brandy and bitters, which is, uh, you know, about the definition of old school when it comes right down to it. And uh, also a little bit of triple sec. Ooh. So we will, you know, do, got to take the edge off, you know, the brandy. Well, the brandy, of course, is going to be sweet, but the, the bitters as well. And then what we do, we have a champagne flute. And we start to pour this into the glass. Each one of the glasses gets a bit. Then we top it off with a little bit of champagne. And that's the champagne flute, because it's much easier to pour champagne into a flute than it is a regular glass. And we top it off with a twist of lemon. So we end up with this kind of very sophisticated and yet light and you know easy to drink cocktail which is reminiscent of Chicago of the, at least the turn of the last century. So cheers. Cheers. Am I going to love this or hate it? Well, I think you'll like it because of the brandy. Okay. Not because of the champagne. I am not a fan of champagne. <clears throat> That's actually really good for a <laughs> sore throat. Brand, well. Yeah, brandy is good for sore throats. Yes. Yeah, I spent a lot of time outside yesterday. I made a very foolish mistake. We have uh, three black belly ewes. And so one of them was lying in a very particular spot. And I thought she was going to be the third to have her lamb. So when I came back, there was a sheep that looked like her lying in the same spot with the lamb. So I got excited, told the entire world, we have a third lamb. Went out a couple hours later and she had no lamb with her. I'm like, oh no, is she, you know, the baby died or uh, she rejected it or whatever. And long story short, there was an awful lot of stress involved in that, including taking the UTV into the field, which is not an easy feat. Searching for that lamb, finally realized I hadn't looked at the ear tag. <laughs> and that sheep has not had her lamb yet. So that's probably part of why my throat got totally slaughtered again after I thought I was on the mend. Uh -oh. So reading number three, writing the L. Writing the L. So this is from my collection of short stories, Tiny Gateways. Um, and these are uh, all portal stories. So a portal story means that a character has fallen into another land. And this one is a weird Western. <clears throat> a bit of manure that... We warm smell of cows, grass, and farming floated across the car of the L train, moving its way between the passengers sitting on hard benches. I looked at each person, their faces stuck in phones or iPads. No one wrinkled their noses. No one picked up their feet one at a time to look at the tread looking for shit. Besides, where would they get manure in Chicago? Dog and human shit smelled totally different. I inhaled, trying to focus that on that bit of farmland, crops, plows, and horses. The stink of B.O., pots, stale beer, and fake flowery scents tried to block me, but I pushed them away, closing my eyes. The manure smelled of friends, of home, of adventures I couldn't have here. Then the smell was gone like it had never been there. I hit my knee in frustration, startling the blue-haired girl next to me. She looked up from her paperback novel with a shirtless man on the cover and raised an eyebrow. Sorry, I said. I stood up and moved to the middle of the car, holding onto the strap over my head, letting the sway of the train move through my body. I closed my eyes and strained for the huff of a steam train that sounded nothing like the whoosh and thumps of the L careening through tunnels. Someone's phone chimed the sound like a train whistle. Had I gone through? If I opened my eyes, would I be home? The L lurched and slowed, the bell dinging to signal a stop. I groaned under my breath and opened my eyes. 
passengers shoved around me trying to get off and onto the platform. I grabbed a seat on one of the hard benches, sipping the shitty coffee from my to-go cup. It wasn't gonna happen, not today, maybe not ever. Today I'd have to go to my shitty police detective job and then take the shitty L back to my shitty apartment and stay in my shitty life. The train lurched again as it got going and a woman's high heels snapped under her weight. She yelped, her arms flailing as she caught herself. No one moved to help. Fucking shoe, the woman cursed, taking it off and staring at the broken heel while standing on one foot. She looked around, obviously not wanting to put her bare toes down on the stains, dirt, and garbage around her. Holding the shoe in one hand, she clapped her hand over her purse, glaring at the person who bumped her. She was probably right. He was likely trying to grab her wallet, her keys, her phone, whatever he could grab while her shoe distracted her. I looked away, the train picking up speed. The lights flickered and I glanced back toward the woman. Her clothes changed, her face shadowed by a bonnet tied with a pink ribbon. I looked down, feeling my clothes shift, feeling the thin hoodie become rigid, turning into a corset, part bullet protection, part fashion. Blink, a woman across from me wore a green gingham printed blouse. Blink, a woman fanned herself with a feather fan, the tight curls around her face moving in the air. Blink, perfume floated in the air and I closed my eyes to focus. Flowery and something the woman with a fan would say was from Paris or New York, but she bought at the general store in her local town. The train began to rock back and forth rather than lurch and swish. Clacking and chuffs from the engine filled the air. It was happening. A tear ran from my closed eyes, but I didn't open them. I didn't want to see my shitty world. Didn't want to give it a chance to take back over. Heart pounding, I breathed deep. Unwashed bodies, alcohol-laced perfume, and fried, a fried chicken lunch, manure, and that smell of freshly plowed fields. The light in front of my eyes changed, brightening. I wasn't underground anymore. I opened my eyes. A train car full of people swayed back and forth. The women wore skirts or thin leather pants, their tops covered by corsets. Some had gloves, some hats with feathers and beads, and some wore men's cowboy hats. Two women wore holsters at their waists, and he knew the rest had weapons stuffed down their cleavage or tucked into boots. The men wore suspenders, high boots, tight pants, hats, and of course, guns at their waists. One had a curved French blade and a scabbard across his hip. I sighed in relief, feeling my corset catch against my ribs. Glancing down, I saw my leather pants, knee-high boots, mud on the heels, and my leather overcoat. Turning my head, I noted the man on my left, Deputy Johnson my deputy. He turned his head to look at me, one eye a bright green, the other with a thick metal monocle over it, letting him see the surrounding magic. Sheriff, he told me with a nod. Lucy, I corrected him as I always did. I dabbed at my damp eyes with a handkerchief, pretending I'd gotten a bit of train dust in him. Home. Finally, I was home, hopefully forever. I like that ending. Did she end up kind of in a steampunk? sort of world it's a steampunk yeah so okay steampunk um tends to be victoria england a weird western is united states um same time frame but very very different world because that's the wild wild west okay it certainly sounded though like chicago's a very shitty place i just have to say it did yeah it really <laughs> did <laughs> it, it kind of reminded me of living on a farm <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. Michael wants to keep this very PG. So. Oh, my bad. <laughs> you know, when I read the description of this anthology, I wondered if this idea, you know, an entire collection of stories of going through portals, are these kind of stories of escape? you know, or mm -hmm. see other themes in them? Yeah, so basically um, I put this one together because I still have not gone through a portal and I really would like to. I mean, Narnia, Oz, Never Never Land, something like that would be amazing, but it still has not happened. So um, you can keep hoping. You should read Laura's book. She'll take you right through a portal back to the 12th, 13th century. Welcome. Oh yeah, I will, I will. Yeah. So um, these coll this collection of short stories is um, people like Lucy who desperately, desperately want to go to a portal, or there's also characters who don't want to fall through a portal. Some that go uh, intentionally and some that go accidentally. So it's kind of fun. Do the ones that don't want to go get to go first? <laughs> uh, I forget the order I put them in. Yeah. Okay. 
do they end up in places they don't want to be? Is that why they don't mm -hmm. want to go? Yep. So uh, is part of the idea that some people are happier with their lives than others? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, because I love this concept and uh, Sean McGuire does does a fantastic job uh, with her collection of wayward children. And those stories are about the Wendy's and the Alice's who fall through portals, find lands that they adore. And then when they grow up, get shoved back out into the real world, which would be very traumatizing so her stories are about what happens to those children afterwards oh, um, and i really liked this this idea of like finding a place where you belong and you're happy and yeah maybe it's weird but um and you end up it ends up getting taken away from you and kind of what that does to you um how do you respond to reality again probably not very well i think that's actually a powerful theme in today's world especially where we can get very lost in tv and games and it's very easy to escape reality mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a good thing we should face reality sometimes you're also a publisher do mm -hmm. you have kind of a common theme in the the books you publish or what you look for in an author so i prefer um spec fiction so uh, for our eight, yeah nine million listeners so, so thank you peter you gained us a couple hundred thousand yes indeed Woohoo! I love that. Yes. <laughs> uh, so spec fiction is going to be um, horror, fantasy, sci-fi. There's so much genre bending happening now where you've got a mystery in space that's got some horror stuff to it. Anything genre bending, I love. So if you're like, oh, I don't quite know what genre that is, that's okay. Um, just go ahead and send it to me. I have also been playing around with contemporary romance just because it's I... quite different. Yeah, it really is. But um, I like this idea of exploring exploring love um, and exploring early relationships, too. I also <clears throat> wanted to do, I love where I live. Um, I live in Temecula, which is part of San Diego. Um, I love it so much. And I really wanted to do kind of a homage to the San Diego area. So Lying, Baking, and Surfing came out last year, and that's a really fun little sweet romance. And then Lying Gods and Fandoms will also be out later this year too, and that's a part two about um, two other characters who fell in love in Lying, and, Baking, and, and Surfing. That, there is a little bit of a story behind what inspired River City Widows, if you want to tell that. Yeah, yeah. So River City Widows, I came up with River City Widows when I went to visit my oldest and dearest friend. She, um, unfortunately, since uh, she has a lot of health issues and since COVID really has not left her house in a long time. But when I went to visit her, she was telling me about her next door neighbor who house had a granny unit and that um, her next door neighbor had just invited a gentleman to live in the granny unit. And I said, oh, that would be such an awesome uh, story, a great romance. And I said, but I'd have to add ghosts to it. And she said, well, you should write that. <laughs> so that's where River City Widows came up. I, I was just struck through the whole reading of the book. Uh, we call it a mother-in-law unit, but it's called a granny unit mm -hmm. where you live. Yeah. It's, I, I find regional differences very interesting. Like we just moved from Northern Minnesota to Tennessee. I did not know that people in Tennessee have a Southern drawl. Uh, that was oh. a surprise to me. And every time I go in the grocery store, they're like, would you like a buggy? And I'm imagining, you know, a little pram with babies in it. <laughs> well, it's I shopping cart. Yes. Right, right. You know, we call it a shopping cart and everyone calls it a buggy here. So I, I was just struck by that. I, I think that's a fun thing. They always look at me weird when I go, what? Room, room for a buggy. You know, they just, not, not <laughs> that is fun. Yeah, I like that. Well, and you use the term pram too, which is very um, English. Um, we right. Don't, yeah, we don't use that very much in the United States either. No, I, I typically wouldn't use pram, but I think of the pram as, you know, the, the longer one that the baby lies down in and has the hood. Right. right. I did have a fantastic Peg Perigo stroller, if you're familiar with those, when I had my twins. This was an amazing thing of engineering end, yes. you could go from one seat to two to three to four you could have these seats facing each other both facing front both facing oh. side by side you could do like anything with this stroller and normally i don't get so excited about strollers but this was a really neat stroller i think i cried when i had to sell it because oh. i didn't 
I, I have still three. Cries, I do. You know. <laughs> I do sometimes. Um, I had three kids who kind of needed a stroller at the time. So mm. I kind of went high end. What, what is next for you? I'm still wrapping up um, Lion Gods and Fandoms, which is set at Comic Con, except it's not set at Comic Con because I can't use that word. It's set at Hero Con in San Diego. And I, I, if you've never been to Comic-Con, it's a, an incredible experience. And I love um, this concept so much because this couple, um, they're going through a rough patch. One of them loves Comic-Con, can't wait to go. The other one is like, what the heck is that thing with, that, that sounds disgusting, I don't want to go. But, you know, trying to fix the relationship and everything else. So she's like, yeah, that sounds like fun. And then she gets told, oh, you need a fandom. You need to have like something that you go and you like try to get the autographs and you try to stalk the celebrities and you get all of the merchandise and everything else. And she's like, whatever, I'll choose that one. And then he goes, you chose that one. That's the worst show ever. And, but they <laughs> lie the entire time about adoring it. So, you know, it's just a couple trying to fix their relationship through Comic-Con. That sounds like fun book. And speaking of things that are next, how about you? Laura? Yeah, how about me? Uh, I'm working on like a dozen manuscripts and it's a really stupid thing to do. <laughs> but I would but be who I am. If... <laughs> right, right. I remember my trombone professor back in college telling me repeatedly, you've got to focus on one thing. I'm like, I can't. That's not who I am. I just can't. So where can people find you online, Teresa? Best place to find me is going to be www.teresahauthor.com. And then that's going to be pretty much um, everything that you find on Facebook and, t and Twitter is going to be Teresa H. Author. Okay. So. Okay. Fantastic. Laura, where can we find you? We we news. we can find me, and so can the rest of the world at lauravosica.com. Facebook is going to be uh, facebook.com slash laura.vosica.author. I'm on Instagram at Gabriel's Horn Books, if you spell books BKS, which in English class you shouldn't, but on Instagram you should. Michael, you will find at anything. A perfect pint, so a perfect pint.net. And you will find Michael and I at booksandbrews.net. And we are also on Instagram at book and brews, the letter N. And we're on Facebook at www.facebook slash books and brews with Laura Vosica and Michael Agnew. Dot com. And then you risk fall off. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Then you have to take a deep breath. Do you have any upcoming events, Teresa? I am actually going to be at WonderCon at the end of March. I'm going to be at LA Festival of Books in April. I will be at um, Comic Con Revolution in May. And I will be at San Diego's Comic Con. So, um, selling books, signing autographs, chatting with people. So, if you're in the Southern California area, come and find me. I'm at one of the events. Do you do the full cosplay thing when you go to something like Comic Con? Not when I have a table. That's way too much work. It's already hard enough. <laughs> When I was doing those, I dressed in the medieval gown. I brought me the evil harp. I brought a sword and and, and a sackbut. And I just happened to have oh this my thing gosh. around. Yeah. So when I was going to these, I would bring the helmet and this the uh, full claymore. And so this helmet is really cool. And kids had a lot of fun. So did adults actually trying it on. Oops. No, it's caught in my hat, and so I might be stuck in a helmet. <laughs> uh, you brought this as, on yourself. I know. As I mentioned, uh, I stayed up way too late writing, and so I had a choice of either take a shower and wash my hair, which meant getting up 20 minutes earlier, or put on a hat. So, um, and we're seeing the hat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuck in a helmet. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, anyway, we'll just, uh, you know, not do a visual on the rest. Um, <laughs> yeah, my upcoming events are not quite exciting. I'll be so like rabbit poop. I am so sick. I'm getting a little punchy. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'll be selling rabbit poop. That's tell, tell them where because I'm coughing. <laughs> oh, well, the overhome. Yeah, the uh, overhome trading post. Trading post and, which uh, um, is a wonderful kind of, you know, homesteading yeah, kind of really group where people sell anything from eggs to Korean barbecue. 
and uh, we are somewhere in the middle of that selling uh, rabbit poop. But we all have yeah. books, and yeah. we sell knitted goods. So, I'm kind you know. of poking fun at myself. I yeah. also sell my books there, and I sell other people's books there. Um, but there is nothing like selling rabbit poop. It's it's excellent fertilizer. That's why we sell it. Um, so she said, I can see that. Just trying yeah. to dispose no, of it's, the rabbit it's poop. It's really, really good, really good <laughs> fertilizer. It's about the best fertilizer there is. But there is nothing better for developing the virtue of humility than selling rabbit poop. <laughs> Well, it's the whole process ahead of that. It involves drying, I mean, collection, drying, bagging, movement. You know, there's a, there's a whole manufacturing process, and it's right. um, it's quite involved. What's coming next month, Laura? I say this every month, and every month it's true. We have next month J.S. Absher, and the reason I'm really excited to meet him is because he has had his poetry in i believe all four of my anthologies and so i put out an annual anthology i was just kind of seeing if i had one handy but i don't think i do and so i'm excited to kind of meet him a little more in person although it'll be by zoom so j.s absher grew up in small towns and rural communities in southwest virginia and northwest north carolina going to college at brigham young and duke he served in france as missionary for the church of jesus christ of the latter-day saints and briefly as a consultant in Taiwan, a teacher in Belize, and an adjunct professor at Southern Virginia University. Hopefully not all at the same time. Hopefully. <laughs> Although if he was me, that's probably what I would do and then complain that I'm too busy. He retired from 30 years in insurance to become a writer, poet, editor, and sometimes publisher. And his poems have won several prizes, been nominated for the Pushcart Poetry Prize, and as I said, been in all four of my annual anthologies so far. So I'm really looking forward to talking to him. Awesome. So thank you for being our guest. It was, it's been quite a challenge finding a date. So cheers. 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 <laughs>